It is my absolute pleasure to introduce all of you to Dr. Amanda Smith. Amanda is a researcher, an energy analyst, and an educator. She spent many years creating and interpreting com computer models of buildings and energy systems. She enjoys studying the relationships between building energy performance, climate, costs, and emissions. She received a doctorate in mechanical engineering, and her professional career includes academic, national laboratory, and industry positions. At Project Drawdown, she serves as a senior scientist focused on making the built environment better for humans and the rest of the living world. Thank you so much for joining us, Amanda. Take it away. Thank you for that big welcome. Thank you all for joining us. Um, especially I'm seeing a few folks from LA. I was recently there and um, it's been tough times. So I'm really glad all of you could make it and to see so many people from so many different places. Let me give you the presentation I'm looking at. So I want you to start by observing what's around you. Um, I'm assuming most of us are in buildings or maybe you're somewhere with really nice weather and you can see a building next to you. And we're gonna do this a few times and try to relate the talk to what you're actually seeing. So the first thing I want you to think about, even if you're indoors, what do you know about the literal shape of the building you're in? Which direction is it facing? Why do you think it was built that way? I'll show you a few other buildings and let's just get curious. So I show you this because I think it's a good example of what I consider to be a green building or just a good building. And it's one that really complements its environment. And that includes other buildings, uh, local waterways, existing trees and wildlife, and its social environment. So a building that connects us with a shared purpose. In this case, it's a library. Um, and I think complementing the environment also means minimizing the amount of heat trapping greenhouse gas emissions that it creates. So what I wanna to say today is there's a lot of ways that buildings are tied to greenhouse gas emissions. That's the focus in this talk or pollution and waste more broadly. And so I wanna show you what's the web of relationships between a building and the wider world. And we'll talk about what, what does that mean at the individual building scale, even though I actually think there's no such thing as an individual building. And here's what I mean by that. This is, you should see a quote um, from a great novel by Richard Powers. And it's saying the bird and the branch are a joint thing, right? That's how a forest functions. Well, a building and the land that it sits on are also a joint thing. And we as people and our buildings and the earth are not truly separable. So we'll focus today on illuminating connections. Now you will see if you go and look different estimates of how much of our global emissions ought to be attributed to buildings. Project Drawdown attributes the sources by where the greenhouse gases are entering the atmosphere. And just under 6% of emissions year to year are happening globally because we're burning stuff at a building. Now you'll also see a lot of people claiming buildings are responsible for 39 or 40% of global emissions, including in my previous papers. And when you trace the data and the assumptions, it usually comes back to the International Energy Agency, but they only consider energy related emissions. So that doesn't include food, agriculture, and land use, which is a major part of the climate system. And then if you look at data for the US, they say that buildings in the States are 13% of direct emissions. So that includes burning fossil fuels, some waste, some F gases, which we'll get to, it's not a, it's not a bad word. Um, or 30% if you also include the emissions for the electricity used by our residential and commercial buildings. Okay, so that's a lot. <laughs> different organizations have different ways of sorting them and tying them back to buildings. And sometimes they aren't even considering all the emission sources that we know about. So the question is, do we need to agree on one number to be able to tackle climate change and make changes in the building sector and beyond? Well, I wish everyone would be very clear on what emissions are being taken into account, but I have fallen into a rabbit hole trying to figure out where the different numbers are coming from. And I really wanna give you here the upshot, which is we can't address climate change or 
any of the many imbalances that we're concerned about on our planet without changing how we build and how we operate our buildings. Climate change will not stop without major changes in the building sector. And that's because changes in the building sector, so changes to how we build and how we operate them, can make it easier to decarbonize everything else, electricity generation, manufacturing, transport, and beyond. Another reason to pay attention to buildings is they're growing. So we tend to talk about the size of buildings that are out there by their floor space. So literally that's just the amount of indoor area we have in square feet or square meters. And the floor area in the building sector across the world is expected to increase 75% by 2050. Here's what that looks like. So if this left square represents about the floor space we have now, then we're gonna be adding this much, we're estimated to have this much new floor space by 2050. Um, so a lot of that new growth will be in faster growing countries, low and middle income countries. Um, and for us in areas that are slower growing, a lot of the existing floor space that we have now will make up the bulk of our building stock in 2050. Okay, so if I wanna understand how buildings affect the climate, how do I even decide which ones are from buildings? Well, a really simple place to start is what are the emissions that happen at the building? And Project Drawdown, we call these building sector emissions. I think the logic is pretty clear. We'll talk about what they are. There's two culprits I want to focus on. First, no surprise, burning fossil fuels. The second you might not have heard of called F gases. It just means they're fluorinated gases. I'm telling you something about their chemical structure. And I'll show you in a few slides exactly why they're a really big deal. But know that they're important for buildings because the vast majority of the refrigerants we're using now, that's the chemical that powers things like air conditioning, um, your refrigerator, right, are F gas chemicals when they get into the atmosphere. So I want to be clear, almost all of them worldwide come from fossil fuels. So those are emissions that happen at the building. And as we electrify buildings, we do see that that percentage of our overall yearly emissions is coming down in the building sector because we're burning less stuff in buildings. But let's step outside of the percentages and just look at what's really happening. Our fossil fuel consumption is not in a good place right now. And here in the US, we reached a record high for gas consumption on January 16th, 2024. Now, the good news is at last year's United Nations Climate Conference, we had world leaders agree that the era of fossil fuels must end. So we have a clear common goal. And what happens in the building sector can drive these lines upward or make it easier for us to bring them down. Now we also have emissions happening somewhere else, but they're happening because of stuff that we're doing in the building sector. Broadly, we'll go through what those sectors are. So when a building uses electricity from the grid, some of that comes from power plants that burn fossil fuels. As the grid gets cleaner, that means less and less of the electricity comes from fossil fuel plants each year. A building is made of stuff and making stuff creates emissions. It uses energy. Sometimes the process of making something will give off a byproduct that's a greenhouse gas. So these are manufacturing emissions that happen because we want stuff for our buildings. And that stuff and all the people who construct the building and eventually occupy it will need to be transported there. So we have transportation sector emissions. And when a building uses fossil fuels for energy, those fossil fuels actually have emissions associated with them that happen even before the fuels reach the building. And we call these other energy related emissions. And the food that we eat, we mostly eat in buildings. We deal with food waste there. Uh, land is used, and I don't like the phrase land use. Um, I, th I think we need to change our mentality, but that's how we talk about it in this, in this uh, area of science. So land is used for the building, but land is also tied to the building through building products that are grown and mined. And in some parts of the world, forests provide fuel for energy use in the building. So we'll talk about each of these in more detail, but here's the big picture. Emissions in buildings connect to every other sector. We can't address the climate problems our buildings are causing if we don't also address what's happening in those sectors. And we can't address the climate problems in those other sectors without changing what happens in buildings. So we'll start fleshing that out 
and connecting them to actual processes on the ground. First, let's think of what's happening globally. So this is kind of the project drawdown story of our annual emissions. Imagine this gray rectangle represents our atmosphere and we're putting greenhouse gases into it every year. The left side of this diagram shows where these gases are coming from in proportion. These are the sources of heat trapping gases um, in these six general sectors that we've seen. And a little less than 6% are happening in the building sector. These are things like boilers, furnaces, water heaters. But let's notice where all those emissions are going. Do they all just sit there? Not all of them. So most of the gases we emit are hanging around up there and that's what creates this heat trapping effect. Our lands and oceans also take up some of the carbon dioxide. That's not necessarily sustainable at the same rate, but just to give you a picture of what's happening now. And we can work to support these natural sinks on the right-hand side, like forests and oceans. And in the building sector, that means not building on really special places like wetlands or old growth forests. But our biggest focus has to be on shrinking the left side of the graph, on reducing the sources of greenhouse gas emissions quickly. So knowing where they're coming from and where they go helps us find suites of climate solutions that can help us reach this global goal. So we'll be looking at how emissions and buildings connect to these other sectors. But first I wanna pause because I may have some engineering friends on here who've noticed, I just said gases, even though it's not all carbon dioxide, and I haven't yet given you a common measurement unit to tell you where these percentage numbers are coming from. What you'll see, I'm presenting in what's called a 100 year global warming potential CO2 equivalent. And if you want to learn more about the nitty gritty science behind that, it's kind of a cool idea. There are different ways to do it. Click on the link in the chat or grab that afterwards and read the explainer. But here's what you need to know. Okay. For gases other than carbon dioxide, we convert the amount that's emitted to a CO2 equivalent value in terms of global warming. So that equivalent value tells us how much climate warming a different gas can do compared with the climate warming that carbon dioxide does. And here are what the actual different gases are that we're emitting. And so most of it's CO2, right? Carbon dioxide, we focus on that because it's the biggest one. It's most of what we emit and it's most, but not all of our climate problem. So you'll see things like methane, which is CH4, nitrous oxide, N2O, and these are gases that we're releasing from burning stuff and from our agricultural practices. But I want you to notice this little sliver that's bright red and pink that says F gases 2%. The way buildings contribute is we have refrigerants that are getting released into the atmosphere. They're chemicals we use for refrigeration and AC. And so most of them wind up being these fluorinated gases if they get out. The fluorinated gases have enormous global warming potential. So let me illustrate for you why I'm worried about it, even though it's a small percentage of the global picture. Let's start with carbon dioxide. So this is our main greenhouse gas and we use it as a baseline for comparing other gases, right? Imagine that this little blue circle represents the amount of warming effect that one ton of carbon dioxide will have. That means the circle's area represents it's warming effect. So if we look at methane, whoa, the circle just got a lot bigger. The warming effect of one ton of methane, which is the main component in what we call natural gas, has a powerful warming effect. Now, this circle's area represents the size of the warming effect that one ton of a particular type of refrigerant called R134A will have. And the takeaway from this picture is that a little bit can do a lot of damage. The good news here is we've already phased out refrigerants that are 1,000 times more powerful than this one. That means I couldn't even illustrate it to scale. You wouldn't be able to see the carbon dioxide at all. And we're well on the way to finding alternatives for 134A. It's already been phased out of being used in cars for air conditioning. And we're finding new alternatives and new practices in buildings. But the bad news is, 
This one is abundant in the atmosphere among the refrigerants that are in use today. And F gases, right, these fluorinated gases, we call forever chemicals. They don't really break down like other chemicals in the atmosphere do. And if we emit it, it just hangs up, hangs around up there, and we have to deal with it. So let me start connecting this to processes, and I'm going to organize it according to how people working in the building sector classify emissions related to those buildings. They start with, we start with, emissions that happen because the building is using energy to operate. So that includes what I've showed before as building sector emissions. They're mostly from burning fossil fuels. It also includes the other main way we provide energy for buildings, which is with electricity. And electricity emissions are also almost all from burning fossil fuels. What that looks like is we have electricity re related emissions when we burn fossil fuels at the plant. We can even have emissions from incomplete burning of fossil fuels or leaks that happen in that system. And we do have losses that happen between the power plant as it goes through the transmission and distribution network. And those losses mean there's a multiplying effect, right? We have to make a little more than we actually need to deliver because of that. So the emissions that happen because of decisions we make at a building, but are not happening because of their energy use, we call embodied emissions. The idea is think about a material or a piece of equipment that we use at a building site. There were already emissions that happened while it was being made. So we kind of imagine those emissions being embodied in that thing. And I'm gonna take another pause here. I'm gonna ask you to look around, find just one material or one device that you can see and ask yourself, what do I think it took to make this? Where might the materials have come from? Where might the energy have come from to manufacture it? These manufacturing emissions are industry sector emissions. Indus industrial emissions that relate to buildings are largely from concrete because making cement is a lot of our worldwide emissions. They're from insulation. So making insulation material and installing it, depending on how it's being installed, will create emissions, as well as metals like steel and aluminum and glass has a lot of embodied emissions as a material. Transportation sector emissions, we also consider embodied. They happen in getting something or someone to the building. Transportation emissions are from burning fossil fuels. We can also have emissions when fuels escape, and transportation sector includes shipping and rail transit and air travel. So we have to often ship building products from where they're made or processed to where they need to be used. Food, agriculture, land use emissions can happen on other land besides the building site. And globally, one of the things driving these types of emissions is deforestation that can tie to the buildings through a demand for forest products. It can also tie to our need to have fuel for cooking. And if you wanna learn more about that, you'll see a link to a couple of project write on reports, one on the connections between climate and poverty, and one on our options for reducing a pollutant called black carbon. And electricity emissions, I also put over here because remember we can use electricity in these other sectors that are still driven by things we want for our buildings. So we've already looked at images of how they create emissions. Other energy emissions, remember is this bucket where we group up emissions that happen before fuels get to the building to be used. What that can look like is fossil fuels being burned at a processing site. We can have leaks at the site of extraction all the way down the chain to where they're being used. And we can have um, an indirect multiplier effect because we have losses, right, from the site of extraction and to where it's being used. So embodied emissions are increasingly getting attention in the building sector and they're increasingly a climate concern. I'm going to show you some cool research that illustrates really well why and what we're seeing in the building sector research. Now, Emissions from buildings energy use is a little wordy. So I'm gonna use the lingo operational emissions, right? We're operating the building. So 
So here I want to show you um, some images from a really neat paper where they looked at what's called a life cycle analysis, looking through the lifetime at the emissions created for different buildings in different climates and in different countries. And what we have is different types of buildings shown here. So on the left side, I have um, a building that's built to kind of an existing standard, kind of a okay, acceptable new building, right? But not too aggressive in terms of its energy features. On the right side, I have an advanced standard. So these are buildings that are designed to be really high performing, really careful about their energy use. And in the middle is something in between. What we see, right, is the embodied emissions, which are the red portion of the bars, are a big proportion of the emissions for those high performing buildings. So let's think about this as an example building, right? What are the emissions that are happening over time? Because when they happen matters, emissions that we cut now are better than emission cuts we make in the future. So let's look at that. What we're seeing here is the building's life cycle. And on the left is the start of the building. Okay, so this is when the building's in production and construction. It hasn't started to use operational energy yet, so it doesn't have operational emissions, but we have this big chunk of embodied emissions happening right there. That's because putting the building together is the time when we use the most materials. In the middle of the building's life cycle, we often have another big chunk of embodied emissions because we're renovating or updating. And at the end of its life, we have some waste being produced, if we're not really careful, we can have refrigerants being released. And so this is why doing a demolition and rebuilding on the same site is really a big punch in the gut for emissions. And that's why talking about creative reuse of existing buildings is a really big deal. So we saw the global picture of what's happening. Let's talk about how can this inform decisions we make on a smaller scale. I think the key is looking at interfaces. So those can be interfaces between the building and its neighborhood or city or bioregion, as well as the connections between buildings and other sectors, electricity consumption, food, ag, and land use, manufacturing and industry, transportation, and other energy related emissions. So let's really zoom in. I want you to start thinking about what are the interfaces between a building and its direct surroundings? Buildings last for a long time and decisions about what we use to uh, run them and keep them comfortable will drive our energy consumption for years in the future. Um, this is illustrating some HVAC equipment on a rooftop. We've seen that buildings contribute to emissions largely, but not all through fossil fuels. How do we use this knowledge to guide us forward to building the world that we want? I'm gonna ask you to stop and pause. And I wonder, do you know where energy is being exchanged with the outside to keep you warm or cool? Do you know where air is entering and leaving your building? Do you know how it's getting heated or cooled? And did you personally change some settings to get the temperatures you want at the times you want, or did someone else do that? I wanna share with you an idea that I've been thinking about a lot, which is just that each climate problem contains the kernel of a possible solution. So I got to spend some time this weekend with my little nephew. He's really fascinated with acorns in his neighborhood. And the idea that they can turn into a new tree, they can be food for squirrels. We can run over them with our tricycle and scatter the pieces and maybe they become soil. I know that sounds a little abstract. Let's see an example. This is a climate concern we have. We have a growing use of air conditioning. And the reason that's a concern is air conditioners use a lot of electricity, so there's emissions associated with that, but they also tend to drive peak loads, right? They tend to drive the highest load up. And growing air conditioning units means we're growing the amount of refrigerant that we have out there. And there's also a multiplying effect, right? because the growth of air conditioning between now and 2050 that we expect to see is staggering. We have new buildings, we've seen that. We have increased standards of living, which is good. 
but we also have buildings that are less likely to be designed to keep cool without relying on mechanical equipment. And we have climate change and urbanization, which means it just takes more effort to keep a building cool. Now, I wanna to talk to you about air conditioner technology. So what an air conditioner is doing is it's taking heat from the inside of your house, putting it to the outside of your house. Okay, each of the gray boxes represent a piece of equipment and the colored arrows represent a fluid circulating. That fluid is called a refrigerant. Um, the colored arrows just mean that it's changing phase. So if you wanna learn more, I would love to teach you about this, but I don't have time. I've selected an explainer that is true and entertaining so you can learn more about this cycle, but I've given you all you need to know to follow me here. What I wanna say is this same technology, this same diagram is what's in a heat pump. So the heat pump takes heat from the outside and brings it inside. Now, I just swapped those. You can't invert your house, but it's actually really simple to add a reversing valve and change where the refrigerant's going so it functions either way. A heat pump can have a heating mode and a cooling mode. And it's a climate solution because it allows us to replace fossil fuel heating machines with efficient electrical ones, and it emerged from the exact same technology. And bonus points to you, if you noticed, there's a layer here. Because we have refrigerant circulating, usually that refrigerant is an F-gas chemical. So we need to be really careful not to release them while we're installing and operating all these new air conditioners, all these new heat pumps. And that means the reverse is also true. Each climate solution also contains the kernel of a possible problem. It doesn't have to germinate. I just want us to be aware that it's there. I'll give you kind of an interesting example. So a smart thermostat is a climate solution. It has algorithms that optimize to keep your energy consumption down and keep you comfortable. They can save energy. This is a study showing possible energy savings. So taller, taller bars are good, they're energy savings. We see less electricity used for cooling in blue. We see less electricity used for heating um, or fossil fuel used for heating, if that's the case, in red. And so we get less of the emissions associated with that. And in this study, they use energy models, which are computer models of buildings, to see how much energy you could save in some different climates by having what's called a temperature setback on your thermostat. A setback just means, hey, we're not gonna spend as much energy heating or cooling if you're out of the house. We don't need to keep it in a really tight range. And also, when the thermostat is in heating mode, it'll let the temperature go down a little bit at night, which is what our bodies expect anyway. So a few years later, there's a study in New York that indicated the way we implement smart thermostats has the potential to be a concern. What they did was they recorded actual electricity demand coming from thousands of thermostats within New York, and that's shown in green. So I want you to check out the green line. Remember when we come back from a setback, right? The HVAC system, the equipment that's controlling your temperature needs energy to get the temperature back up where you want it. So if we follow the green line, it starts at midnight and you'll see it's growing, growing, and there's a spike that happens before 8 a.m. That's the result of this, everyone asking for the same energy demand at the same time. And this is exacerbated, uh, in this case, with smart thermostats. All the other lines are different studies, but those studies use building energy models. So you can see they don't show the dramatic spike that we're seeing in the actual data. Now, if you're not familiar with research, this is really normal. Every model makes assumptions. We know we won't capture everything. And so we learn as we go by looking at real data. So in real life, the peak load, the top of that green spike actually drives decisions for the people planning and managing the grid. A higher spike means it takes more resources to meet that need. So that's making the grid's job harder because we're asking for generation to ramp up quickly. And the takeaway is just that once we have lots and lots of buildings adopting smart thermostats, we also have to think about what the electrical grid is gonna see. Smart thermostats are great, right? We just have to look at the bigger system. A better way to think about it when we step back and think about that picture is how is the building overall 
interacting with the grid. Not just thinking about how does the grid serve our needs, but how are we interacting? By doing that, we can find solutions that help us reduce emissions across sectors. This is just illustrating some of the multiple ways buildings can kind of lend a hand to the grid. They can be more efficient. They can reduce their energy use. They can also shed load by helping to address that peak demand, by addressing that top spike, making it a little flatter. Or we can shift load, meaning we use electricity when it's easier to meet that demand or when more renewable energy is available. So we step back and look at grid interactive buildings and not just a thermostat or one device. Now, it's important to realize that what we do physically will affect how successful we can be with changes we make in software with algorithms. So two examples, insulation and air sailing are part of what it takes to have a good building envelope. That means a good separation between the inside and the outside. These can make the heating system's job easier, right? Because less air and heat is escaping. If you have a heat pump meeting that heating demand, if your heat pump is high efficiency, or if it's a cold climate heat pump, if that's appropriate, what that means is getting back up to the daytime temperature will take less electricity. So these solutions have a great partnership. And we can also have climate problems, climate solutions, all wrapped up together. One example is just insulation itself. The basic idea, right, is that it lowers our energy use, and that means less emissions associated with that energy use. But we did say earlier, making the insulation itself is a source of some pretty nasty emissions. And installing the insulation, depending on how it's blown in, um, if that's the way, can create emissions as well. So insulation, we think of as a climate investment, right? We're taking a hit in terms of embodied emissions from materials and manufacturing, but we're reducing operating emissions from lowering energy use. We're also seeing a lot of new options for low greenhouse gas insulation, which is really exciting. So it's natural to ask like, how do we just get a solution and not the problem? I wanna say, I don't think we can extract it completely. And I think moving forward means we have the humility to acknowledge that. We don't expect a pure solution and we're willing to look at our problems to see what we can learn from them. We don't ask any one solution to fix everything. So maxing out on wind turbines, maxing out on solar panels, maxing out on heat pumps, cool. But that doesn't magically stop climate change. It doesn't give us good buildings and it doesn't fix equity issues and who can access the benefits of the built environment. So just know all of these things are cool, but we really do these things, as Elizabeth likes to say, as part of a tapestry. So our solutions are woven into a tapestry. And the amazing thing is we're building this as we go. And really, if you think about it, we're being woven in as well. So one of the the most popular pages on our website is our solutions library. It's great if you haven't checked out, checked it out. It's exactly what it sounds like, a library of solutions. But a lot of people want to come and start ranking. So we want to look at a certain scenario that keeps us under a certain rise in global mean temperature, and then look at how do we rank them? Can we take the first one, scale it up, take the next one, scale it up, so on. I get that. But I actually encourage you not to get too obsessed with ranking because we've seen the interrelationships of those fibers in the tapestry are hard to untangle, right? The point of the solutions is we already have enough available to us to deal with our current emissions. And it doesn't speak to your unique situation and the opportunities that you have to make change. So if you haven't seen our Discover tool, I encourage you to check that out. You can um, look by sector, or you can look by um, what your position is, say you're an educator and you're looking for materials, it can help you find the right resources on our site. Okay, so in this discussion around solutions and problems, let's move away from any conversation that implies there's one solution. Let's talk about suites of solutions. And let's also come back to the vision. We're not trying to achieve a global mean temperature for any reason on its own. We're working toward a better world one that's safer, healthier, more equitable. And addressing emissions are one thing we need to do to get there. So we're building this path, we're weaving this tapestry as we go. How do we find our way? 
I want to give some guide rails for the journey. So we try not to do something we know will require solving. Let's go back to thinking about the shape of a building, its form and how it's designed. We used to build buildings according to their environment because we didn't really have a choice. This modern air conditioning technology, the diagram I showed you, that was invented at the beginning of the 20th century. But we have buildings much older than that and many of them are in hot climates and they have really clever designs because they understand what the sun is doing, how the building is interacting with the world. On the left, you see a building in Egypt where the openings can be protected from the direct sun. And on the right, you see a building in Spain with really carefully placed views with some interior space that's shaded. And it's also likely from the way these openings are designed to have some natural air circulation. And there's examples from all over the world, India, Iran, Burkina Faso, of ways to build that are beautiful and functional. So I think we as Americans would do well to learn from other cultures including indigenous cultures who have long histories of living in hot climates and, and having buildings that are livable, that are comfortable, that are resilient. Sometimes it seems like modern buildings are built despite their surroundings. So let me show you what I'm seeing when I look here. In this building's form, you see a lot of edges and corners, right? What that means in general is it's harder to do a great job with the building envelope. It's gonna take more materials and labor to seal it well, more of something like insulation. And every bit of surface area means we can exchange heat and moisture with the outside. So an HVAC system will have to work a little harder in a building like this than a building that's a little more simple and boxy, which can still be beautiful. Here's one visual alternative, which is a high performance home designed very carefully. I can't give you all the features, but you can read about it more at the link. Um, and part of this is understanding, again, how the building's interacting with surrounding trees and what the sun is doing. You might notice some strategic shading on those front windows, right? Each window is highly functional. So the underlying message, build with awareness of the environment. How does it relate to other buildings, local ecosystems, local watershed? And also how does the way we build determine our transportation options? One other thing we do often, is covering an entire side of a building in glass. Well, that's gonna present challenges in terms of heat management and sometimes in terms of light management. So I want you to know the very best, the fanciest window technology that we have is not as good as a, as a wall at separating inside from outside. So when we have windows, they should give us natural light or a view or ventilation or some combination. And we just want the amount that's needed for those purposes. Also, remember, glass has a lot of embodied emissions. So it's a material we want to be responsible with. So I've said there's no such thing as an independent building any more than there's a totally independent person, right? Let's talk about how that fits with our goals locally and globally. I think having clear goals is the first step. And then we check our progress as we're deploying new practices, materials, technology, and adjust based on what we're learning. All right, it's important to know buildings can be healthier for us and the planet with what we have right now. We can be more efficient with building materials. We can use lower carbon cement options. We can use bio-based insulation if that's a fit for our need. And we can make the most out of every square foot or every square meter. Everything we build can preserve opportunities for us to enjoy the planet, to connect to other forms of life, to do that safely, and most importantly, they give us a place to connect to each other. So I wanna leave you with an image of a beautiful place that's really special to me. It's America's first designated national river. And it's unique because there's not development taking place there. There's no homes on the riverbanks. And yet still it's threatened by pollution. That typically comes from industry and agriculture. And I wanna close with a favorite quote from a favorite author because humans built what we have now and we can change how we're building. We need change. And I'm asking, can we begin a resistance together today? Let's take one more pause. I want you to look around and ask, why was this built this way? And what do I wish I could see instead? And maybe there's a way you can start the resistance. Maybe you're a designer who can educate your client on the embodied emissions and help, help them find better options. Maybe you're a homeowner and you can ask when you're switching appliances about low GWP refrigerants or 
how to manage so that refrigerant leaks are going to be small. That's also cost saving for you. And if you're a renter, let your building manager know that you want to support them decarbonizing. Ask them what their plans are so they know you expect it. Thank you so much for spending your time connecting with me here today. I'd love to hear more what you're thinking, so we'll turn it over for Q&A. Hi, Amanda. Great presentation, presentation today. We've got a bunch of questions coming in for you, so I'll go ahead and try and uh, get through them as, as many as possible here in the last uh, 10 or 11 minutes that we have. So first question, I know you just said a moment ago, don't do the ranking of, of solutions, but I think a number of people are wondering if there's like one thing or maybe one, two or three things they can do within their home, apartment, condo to make it more energy efficient, where should we focus our time and effort on, on those energy efficiency upgrades? Yeah, so I mean, I wanna give you the annoying engineering answer of it depends, but let me try to give you some value. I'm like, what does it depend on? I think a great place to start, and I've had um, several friends and colleagues who've had success with this, is find out if your local utility offers help in an energy assessment or if they offer support for an energy retrofit. Oftentimes, it's more beneficial to them to help see electrical loads come down and they provide resources to help you do that. And that'll help you get someone to your home if you're a homeowner to look at the energy balance of your building. And if you know where most of the energy is being lost, then you can address that. For a lot of homes, it tends to be the attic. If air escapes there, it's not very well sealed, and it might not be very well insulated. But that doesn't mean that that's necessarily the case in your home. So it's really ideal to have someone come and look at it and share that with you. The other thing I would point out is all of your appliances will not live forever, right? And so be ready with a plan for next time I have to replace my natural gas boiler, my water heater. Do I know where to get a heat pump water heater, right? Have I looked at the distributors? Because we make so many of those decisions under duress, right? Like, oh no, I don't have this thing that I need and I've got to get it fast. And sometimes we wind up making decisions really quickly that aren't the ones we would make if we had a little more time to look at it. So go ahead and think about what appliances you're going to have to replace and look around, and make a plan for doing that. Oh, Todd, you're muted. I'm muted. So I was going to say great advice yes. as someone who just replaced a natural gas stove with an induction stove. It wasn't as easy as just swapping one out for the other. We had to hire an electrician to come help us with the, the process. So um, next question comes from Sarah. I just want to clarify something. Um, Sarah is saying that um, I have plans to purchase three Fujitsu heat pumps this spring. Should I wait until better refrigerants are available? Um, I guess I wasn't aware that heat pumps used refrigerants, but it makes sense. So is that the case? And should should this person be waiting? Maybe, maybe not. If you switching to a heat pump, especially if you're doing it in conjunction with an energy retrofit, remember how much they help each other, that might actually help you have a more comfortable, more resilient home. And that's the main thing we want for our homes, right? Now, understand there are different ways to reduce the impact of refrigerants. I have a friend in the construction sector, and he points out, like, we really want to get refrigerant down as much as possible so we're not, like, worried about policing it. So there are low GWP options increasingly available, but not so widely available, um, especially for, like, small home systems. So ask about that. But the other thing to understand is if you have done an energy retrofit, if you've sized the heat pump appropriately for your home, meaning the heat pump's not so big, then the heat pump will have less refrigerant in it. So less refrigerant charge means we have less of that gas there that we have to deal with. So making sure that it's right sized for your home, right, also can help in reducing the impacts of refrigerants. And if, that's really the best option for you based on what's available in your area, then just pay attention to it. Ask the installer, how do you keep refrigerant from leaking? I'm curious, there's actually procedures around that. They have a lot of knowledge around it and they can help you make sure you're maintaining it um, so that refrigerant leaks are not happening while it's operating, which also will save you money. We had a few people asking about concrete. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna loop together three different questions here into a two-part question. 
So the first question is um, pretty straightforward, I think. Do the figures on buildings impact include those from the manufacture of concrete? Um, just someone was wondering about that. So the uh, numbers that I'm showing, when I say building sector and it's in this purple color, those are only the on-site emissions. Usually cement is not mixed on site. Um, the cement emissions are actually counted in the industry sector. So a big chunk of the industry sector emissions are actually things we make for buildings. Uh, cement, which is this like substance that makes up concrete, right? Um, is a big one of those. And globally, cement is like about 2% of our annual emissions in terms of the CO2 it makes, because there's like a double whammy. It makes carbon dioxide as a chemical byproduct and it also uses a lot of energy, which is carbon dioxide. So um, yes, it was not included in what I'm calling building sector emissions, but I am trying to make the point that we really need to pay attention to it there because sometimes there are design options where we don't have to pour as much concrete Maybe we can reuse a building instead of demolishing it, or maybe we're pouring concrete that's not there for a structural or a thermal function. And maybe we don't need to do that. So pound for pound concrete is actually not as bad as a lot of types of insulation, but we pour a lot of it. We use so much of it. There was a couple of follow-up questions about alternatives such as hempcrete or you know, using 3D printing rather than using so much concrete. Um, do those seem like viable op op options too? Yeah, I think the hempcrete stuff is really interesting. Um, let me give you some ideas of where you can find deep expertise on this if you really want to dig into the types of it. Um, so there's a guy at Rocky Mountain Institute named Chris Magwood who really studies that issue in particular. Um, and we also have experts at the Carbon Leadership Forum, which is located here in Washington um, at the University of Washington who have done in-depth detailed studies on both the impacts and what's available. Um, and you can also find information from the New Buildings Institute. Great. Um, something that's also come up in the Q&A that I'm really curious to get your take on, and you, I don't think you mentioned this a lot, is the role of building codes. Um, and what do you think about the role of building codes when it comes to making you know our homes and our buildings more energy efficient, using less fossil fuels, et cetera? Um, that seems to be an area where we should be focused a bit more. But what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, so I used to work at Pacific Northwest National Lab, which is known for helping us understand how to make energy codes better and their possible impacts on our buildings. So I definitely have a little bit of bias, but I have a little bit of inside knowledge there too. Building codes are really important and voluntary standards also help because what they're doing is saying, hey, the expectation is that you perform up here and you can figure out how to do it. And there are people working on ways to make the building codes more realistic with the concerns of designers, people working on making tools so that understanding whether you meet a building code is a little bit easier. That's actually a really complex process because um, you kind of have to come up with like, well, if I didn't build this way and I built this way and then compare them. So we're working on making that easier, but I think building energy codes are a really important part of how we got here, as well as appliance standards, which is also when we say, hey, we're expecting your appliance to deliver this much service with this much electricity, and you can figure out how to do it. So they're a big part of how we got here. They are really important. And I think of them as part of how we're transforming design practices, the materials that are available, and what's the norm? Because a lot of the decisions we make necessarily are just based on what's the norm in our area? What does my contractor know how to do? What does the guy at Home Depot sell the most of, right? And that makes sense. We can't all be deep experts in everything. So building codes are one way of saying, hey, we really have a much higher expectation in terms of uh, energy use and being low and service pro services provided, right? Being a good building being really high. They can also make the buildings, more importantly, more comfortable, right? Um, so it can make a building better for us as well. Uh, somebody's wondering about, um, they mentioned that many homes don't have enough south facing roof area to install solar panels. Just wanna do a shout out. I'm not sure where this person is based, but at least here in Minnesota and some other states, we have the opportunity to sign up for community solar. So depending on your location, that might be an option if you, if you um, 
don't have south facing roofs, don't want to, you know, go through the cost of installing solar, et cetera. So community solar may be an option. Um, another pe a number of people are also also asking about geothermal um, within homes. Do you see that, you know, taking off more than it is now, or do you think that kind of heat pumps have have replaced the move around geothermal? Yeah, what's your what's your thought around geothermal? Mm, okay, um, so plus one to the community solar, it's a cool option. And I don't necessarily think every building has to be independent in terms of its emissions. Elizabeth might be able to find, I published a piece on insights on net zero buildings that kind of gives my take on that. That's worth checking out, I think. Um, on geothermal, so let me, let me be clear on technology. We do have heat pumps that are what's called ground source heat pumps. And the reason that ground source is very efficient is because the temperature underground doesn't change as much as the temperature of the air, right? But those are more expensive to install. There's more complexity to it. It really depends. You've got to have someone come survey the ground, right, and design it, right? So there's great opportunities for you to use the ground and exchange heat with it. Um, and that can really boost a heat pump. But air source heat pumps have come so far in recent years. And they've gotten so much better at dealing with cold temperatures that it's really the first stop for most people. Excellent. In the last 30 seconds that we have here, I'd love to hear what's the most important takeaway you want everyone to walk away with from today? Yeah, I hope you walk away with a little more curiosity. Like I hope you look around at buildings and wonder, why do these two buildings look different? Or why does every building I see look the same? Does it really make sense with what the sun is doing? So the reason this person asked about south facing windows, right, is that here in the Northern Hemisphere, we get more sun there. So start asking yourself those kind of questions. You have the ability to understand this. Even without being a building scientist, you can start to think like one. Well, we love your passion and expertise around this topic. I want to say thank you very much for, from everyone who attended for, for this presentation today. I want to let everyone know that we will be sending out a recording of the talk in the next few days, along with all the links that were in the chat. So don't worry, we'll capture all of those for you too. And if you yeah, have there any other resources that... Um, folks want to share, we'll try and capture a few of those from the chat too that we've seen pop up here today. I noticed Rewiring rewiring America, which is a great re resource, and others we might drop into that follow-up email too. So thanks again, Amanda. Thank you everyone for attending. Really appreciate it. Have a great day, everyone. Bye now. Thank you.